I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zias Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to our exciting episode, PF2 and the Anatomy of a Heist, with Massive War for the Crown Part 4 spoilers. Uh, so, this episode is not going to be one that you maybe want to watch if you're thinking of playing War for the Crown, because it spoils the entire ending for Part 4 of War for the Crown, and may spoil other things that are up to this point in War for the Crown that were important to understand the heist. But if you're looking to GM War for the Crown or you don't think that your group's going to want to play War for the Crown or that you're going to be part of a group that's playing it, then this is a great place to learn more about how to do heists and uh, the ways that 2nd Edition factors into that. It's mostly going to just be sort of a story about our session from the Saturday, not this past one, but the one before that, when mm -hmm. this is what happened when I was running War for the Crown in PF2. Just showing how PF2 makes it easier for shenanigans and hijinks and for the players and their characters to do some fun heists. So, um, and Dranzior says that is a really nice introduction. So it's worth noting for YouTube that that introduction is by our own community member, General Twig, um, also known as Nick, a member of the Arcane Mark community who um, we made him a VIP for giving some really cool assets to us. We are... We do our best with the art. I actually really love Linda's um, Leshy emoji that she made, uh, but Aww, we're not um, we're not professionals at that. So no, but. that 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 Leshy emoji took me multiple hours to put together. <laughs> uh, like using various art assets that I found online and things like that. Bye, Arkayan. Bye. Sorry, sorry, we, but wait before you go. Before, there's yeah. one more thing. Today, Jason Bowman gave this. Oh, this is going to be upside down. Gave this to one of these, but obviously not saying Mark Seifter, to every member of the design team um, as a gift that he had actually received for free from Dog Might Games. You might recognize the style, because I said, Jason, is this from the people who made your really awesome um, GM screen for Oblivion Oath? And he said, yeah, Dog Might Games. It's the same people. It looked like it to me as well. It's really cool. And I think it was really nice of them to give one of these to each of us for free because with Oblivion Oath, you know, everybody's going to see that screen every time the game runs. But they didn't really have, um, I feel like, that much incentive to do this other than just the spirit of community and gaming. And it's really cool. It's really nice looking. It is a dice box that has space for one miniature with sort of the soft black inside. So... Now I have a really cool dice box. And they have their website is what was it? Dogmite.com. Um, yeah, it's Dogmite. Yeah, M I G H T. Yeah, M I G H T. And they're actually doing a um, they're actually doing a special uh, Pride Month promotion for until the end of June, um, where a portion of their proceeds go to the Trevor Project, which is really awesome. So if you are interested in picking up some rainbow. Uh, some rainbow wooden cases or dice, then that would be a good place to check out. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Night Trace has the exact link to the Pride Sale. That's awesome. So, Majuna has a question before we get too far into the woods um, about what is the difference between a designer and a developer? Oh, that is a good squirrel. Um, so, <laughs> I'm just going to say that what they are for like pretty much anything else which includes twitch's definition of what they are when it's like hey do you want to put design and development in your tags you'll see that we have them both is not the same as what paizo does what paizo does is kind of weird and maybe not like maybe not like super well um explained um but basically I'll tell you what Paizo does. Well, I know. First, I'll tell you what like video games. Most people in the video games, like the developers, are the ones who are software developers. They're coding like some amount of computer code, and the designers are the ones who are like, "Oh yeah, this would be nice. Go code that." And they come up with like the ideas for the game mechanics and um, the world and other things like that. And then the developers implement it. Uh, that is not how it works at any RPG company. And Paizo works, in fact on a way that makes video game people get it exactly the opposite of right. Mm -hmm. Because a game designer in um, 
really in any board game or RPG is someone who can, they make an entire new game. At Paizo, obviously we're not making entire new games all the time. So we're also the ones who, since we can make entire new games, we are the masters of rules. And that's because it's like, we're the ones who figured out which Legos to put in your set and how Legos work entirely. And um, that's the, those are kind of like the rules. Whereas developers build awesome things out of Legos that people like, like your favorite Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter Lego set or whatever. Um, they figure out which sets they want, what cool things you can build out of the Legos. And developers also have a job title that stretches across like 10 different requirements and varies from developer to developer because it is a kind of ill-defined job that is basically just like, I am not an editor or a designer and can run the gamut from basically, if you think of the game as a movie, um, then if the designers are the ones who perhaps are providing like sort of the basic framework for the movie, maybe they are the script writers of the game, then the developers might do every other job on the entire movie set <laughs> including producing, directing, acting, and it depends on the developer. Um, yeah, so, I like that metaphor. Um, yeah, uh, so there is an entire episode about this. Um, not entirely about that, but it's about what do people do at Paizo and how does the structure work? What are all the steps in making your book? It's up on YouTube because it was one of the earlier episodes. Um, but yes, that is... And one that you should check out, it has a really badly drawn flow chart that I drew that shows you the structure of the company, and it should be helpful. I mean, speaking of the, the topic of uh, derailing, as you know, that's part of why I want to get the squirrel emoji, just to acknowledge that that's, we're easily derailed, and we like answering your questions. Yeah, so, so, you know, if you... I want the squirrel to be on there, and then everyone just posts a bunch of squirrel emojis every time that happens. And then a squirrel can be a sign of, like, guys, you guys are, like, seven tangents from the original topic, or I want to derail you now, here's a point, or whatever. Yep. Anyway, we welcome it. That's right. And Arcane gave a a fairly succinct description of it, but it, it, it can be a problem to oversimplify, especially since, like, everyone, um, who is a professional is, like, is very like fiercely devoted to their um their tasks and very dedicated to performing them and also making sure everyone knows about what they are so um if you oversimplify someone would be like no that's not the only thing that, that we do or... but i think that um in addition to listening to that episode the interviews the continuing interviews that we have with developers like we had we've had uh, both Luis and ron on and they've talked yep. about very different uh very different tasks that they have as a developers with ron as an adventure path developer and Luis as a developer on the player companions going into the uh, world guidebooks yep and um we interviewed you and we interviewed and me, you're, me uh, and uh, I'm an you're in the organized play developer, play developer yes. and those are really the three in pathfinder side the three flavors and starfinder side has their own mirror universe with goatee versions of <laughs> uh, of all those things. But those are the three well, main you know, there's flavors. Actually, there's actually definitely more beards over in Starfinder. Yeah, that's why they're the that, mirror that, universe That's true, because you've got Rob's got a beard, and, yeah. and Jason Keeley sometimes has yeah, a beard. Yeah, that's true. And, and Chris Sims left, Chris but he Sims had one. Left, oh, and he had a beard. leaving, but he has one. Yes. But see, Joe is actually the only one. He may be from Universe Prime, and he went to the mirror universe. Well, that's... That explains it, because he used to be an editor, and now he's on the Starfinder yeah, team. Yeah, see? So that's, figured that's it out. why he doesn't have a beard. Oh, well, yeah. Well, Amanda doesn't have a beard and either. And I didn't think and you were, editor, I didn't think so. you were trying to simplify it uh, too much. I was just making sure that um, that we got it out there, that it is a little bit more complicated, but you had exactly the right idea. All right. Um, Jim Reckless says, the publisher sits around cracking wise and smoking cigars. You just said, don't tell Eric he said that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure video. Eric doesn't watch the right, YouTube video. <laughs> Besides, Eric would probably think it was funny. He would do his old-timey reporter voice that he sometimes does. Like, ah, yeah, see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he would think that was funny. Yeah, uh, we editors, uh, I'm sorry, we publishers just uh, crack wine and smoke cigars or something like that. He, has, he sometimes does that voice. All right, so let's get back on track. We can un... Um, we can unsquirrel ourselves and go it's back. It's only on 23 to... minutes after the hour. We yeah, can start right? our actual topic we now. We can. Right? I mean, we did a lot to talk about the um, the Twitch stream first. That YouTube is like, wait, this wasn't 23 minutes. Oh no, no. But no. um, 
let's go. We're talking today about heists and the way that um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition works with them. That means from this point onward, War for the Crown, people who would be spoilered by knowing about Part 4 of War for the Crown, please head on out. Also, as a reminder, Linda is playing for War for the Crown and they are partway through Part 5, so please know... Do not post any spoilers for after that point in War for the Crown. We have just arrived in a place that it was surprising to arrive in that was very, very far from where we were before. You, know, you don't have to say it like that. We just told them to leave if they don't care about War for the Crown spoilers. So okay, fine. They've just, just arrived, arrived in, in Axis. You're right. We just arrived in Axis. Like, the plane of Axis. Oh, look, guys, you're in Axis. Okay, cut scene. This is the uh, this is the cliffhanger for next episode. So please don't say anything about uh, anything that happens anything after, after Axis. After all right. Or even in Axis, other than being like, oh gosh, we're in Axis. That's right. So, um, we are going to be talking about part four. So, part... I see what you did there, GM Reckless. There Redacted you go. Redacted spoiler for, for part, part three, three of, of book, book five. five. Yeah, they're starting part two of book five. So, part four, City in the Lion's Eye, is the part of the adventure where the PCs sneak into the city of Zimar on the border between Kadira and Taldor. It's a fortress city um, with the fortress of Abadar's Pillar, one of the most impregnable fortresses in all of Taldor, and one of the best defended against a variety of magics um, site that I've ever seen us publish in an Adventure Path volume. And um, the PCs are gathering evidence until they have enough that they can try to arrest uh, High Strategos Maxilar Pytherius, um, awaiting trial for sort of some of the things that his underlings and or Pytherius have committed throughout the course of the adventure path. So we're talking about the end here. That's the part where they do an assault on the fortress of Abadar's Pillar itself. A fortress that has hundreds of guards who are actually some of whom are pretty reasonable level but not great compared to the PCs and a bunch of high level characters and a tactic that says if you have a straight on assault then they're ready for it. They get into two groups like an anvil and a hammer and start scouting to try to find the intruders and smash them between the two groups. That sounds like TPK territory right there for sure. Um, it could be. Either TPK or run away with your tail between your legs. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of ways to escape that aren't necessarily good ways to break in, such as a semi-well-known secret passage, but except for it opens up into a place with no cover or concealment and everyone knows that the passage is there. It's mostly an escape tunnel mm -hmm. that goes into the water. Um, it has a huge number of precautions against magic that are beyond even, like, the Imperial Palace of Kasai at the end of Jade Region Adventure Path. It has, um, let me see what it's got up. If you come in invisible, it automatically alerts where the invisible person is, and it, um, sort of highlights that uh, invisible creatures and illusions. Illusions, right? Because, like, um, we, create, we created an illusion of, of yes. us running around. And that um, there are really high cool. winds, um, that are up above the area in case flying creatures try to sneak in. Um, there is um, no teleportation magic, except for if that teleportation magic is done by people who are specifically attuned to very specific tokens that some of the enemies have. Um, there was some anti-scrying stuff too, wasn't there? There is anti-scrying as well, if you're not attuned to that. Also, it has like a bespoke ability of the diviner who lives there, Dame Avena. To, if she knows the names of who she's looking for, she can determine exactly when and where any and which person um, enter um, into the fortress. That Discovering that one on the fly was interesting. The PCs had expected everything else that I just said, except mm -hmm. for that, based on rumors and just what they kind of thought. But that one was pretty bespoke, um, and that was... That was the one that they weren't ready for. And you know, in any heist, there's the thing that you aren't ready for, <laughs> and then you have to figure out what to do next in the heist. Well, spoiler alert, they were not ready for that. Um, let's go back a bit, though. So they yeah. had enough evidence, and they decided that they're going to heist Abadar's Pillar. Now, Abadar's Pillar, just to make sure that there's no cover or concealment in the courtyard, the gates are completely closed uh, during the night. During the day, guards go out for date for like sort of day leave on um, three in three guard shifts and come back in um, that's how sort of they rotate out but that it only happens during the day all these magical precautions the PCs realize they would have to sneak in using mundane disguises 
So uh, what are RPCs? Okay, so we've got some um, some people in the group. Um, Linda's character, mm -hmm. you can introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, my, my character, uh, Frogry Iron Temper, a armor smith turned lion blade. Um, so she's got some pretty good disguise and deception type ability, especially for a 10 charisma character. She can certainly hold her own. Um, and uh, so I, th I think that was one of the uh, the main things about her at least in getting set up, although we did, although I think we did use a little bit of her, um, a little bit of her armor smithing abilities to hide some of our, hide some of our stuff as we were going in as well. Sure. So, but we had Frogry, um, and GM Reckless says, for RK Mark community members going to Gen Con who may be unaware, several additional tables of PIP 1 and 2 have been added to Gen Con's events, something that were sold out are not available. Yeah, this oh, right. I didn't know that. That's we, awesome. Yeah, we got we got some more GMs, uh, and that's cha that's changing the offerings that we have. That is amazing. I heard that there's some potential for things that may not have otherwise been able to be in there, but everyone who signed up to GMPF two after just getting it shortly before is a hero, and anyone who wants to sign up now at the last minute and maybe make more tables or whatever, heroes. That's that's what I say. Hello, Mr. Blouse. Welcome. Welcome. So, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a, a that's a very, it's a very important squirrel. Uh, game no, reference. Misty Bloss, you're okay. We're talking about the characters in this War for the Crown spoiler, massive spoiler for War for the Crown episode. So, mm -hmm. um, we're going to go into a heist, but it, of course, spoilers War for the Crown. Um, so, Frogger Iron Temper, the dwarf smith and yes. uh, artist. The dwarf, the dwarf who's, smith artist. Whose sister, Golmader, was one of the headsmiths in Zimar working for, uh, Working for Pytherius. Yeah, that relationship got pretty screwed up. By the end of the set, by the end of the that whole thing, she was convinced that my character had sent one of the PCs, this as a fellow PCs, to murder her. That's in true. Her sleep. Yeah. It was a rakshasa. Things happen. Yep. All right. Thumbs up. All right. So we have Frogry. Um, then we also have uh, a few other people. Eustace Lothied who is a cousin to Bartleby Lothied, and um, technically, after the repeal of Agnatic Succession, Primogeniture has become a, through a wide variety of th weird things, the heir to the Betany estate. Um, he is a sort of chaotic diviner wizard who is a part of the group. Uh, they also have T, who is a very skilled rogue, who is a commoner from County Marat, where uh, both T and Eustace grew up. They were friends when Eustace was a child. Uh, but T's parents and Eustace's parents were killed um, earlier on by um, again, massive spoilers for War for the Crown, but by mm -hmm. the um, Sockhill Servitor of, of Panavar, um, Duke Panavar Lothied. Um, we also have Niv, the alchemist, who is a um, the player told me since we started in the playtest, he's like, we're playtesting the game. My character is an alchemist, and he wants to break the game of the world by <laughs> doing infinite loop exploits and other things like that. So he is an alchemist, and he's a member of a like a friendly um, aristocratic secret society called the Immaculate Circle that likes doing exploits. And he's basically, um, he loves Taldor and has Taldor lore, and he's a major patriot and a little bit of a, um, a loose cannon sometimes. But... He definitely works together with the group. Uh, Rocket Lattice, uh, Brian asks if there were character deaths. Nope. Nope, no character deaths. You can see when we talk about things in our new beginnings, but I worked it out from with the players to um, their characters just started uh, with two people who had been born in Marat but left. Because after the, the sock kill started, uh, we actually, yeah, we actually had no deaths. I usually kill a lot of characters, but in PF2, the death and dying system is not the negative hit points, oh, you're dead system. Well, we, we, that's not to say that we haven't had challenging fights. It's not to say that we haven't had characters who are knocked unconscious, but we haven't had any character deaths. Whereas in PF1, the chances are if you're knocked unconscious, you're probably killed past a certain level. Uh, but what happened was Bartleby shipped off Eustace, young Eustace, to a boarding school academy for wizards because he sensed Eustace's potential and figured that Panavar might, Panavar's crazy um, sock kill might kill Eustace because Eustace's mother was part of a conspiracy with Mercator, uh, Bartleby's father, to reveal some information. So um, also, 
T's parents were just some of the peasants that Ellers the Sakil killed because that Sakil likes killing peasants and forcing Bartleby to clean up the mess. Um, so we just had that since the beginning, and we've got our, uh, what is it saying, our alchemist who's a member of the secret society and loves exploits, and Taldor. We have Quingle, the chaotic good gnome cleric of Desna, who also is a Talton history lover. Um, and was sort of has adopted the nation of Taldor as as his own. Um, and let's see, who am I? Who am I missing? Oh, Carla. We have Carla Vinmark of the Vinmark family, the highest family among the Olfin Guard, and um, she is a an imperial sorcerer from a, the the Vinmark line, but also multi-classed into Redeemer of Felena, as well as Bard. So that's really important because Carla is part of the early part of their plan. And then finally, the most important character for the purposes of this story <laughs> is John the Marksman. He was basically a celebrity archer who was known for being an athlete, which is one of the backgrounds in War for the Crown. And the player used the optional rules to have eight intelligence and charisma and he just didn't want any intelligence or charisma skills. He has almost every skill in the game that is not intelligence or charisma, despite this being a AP where you're being spies. So, now, to be clear, oh, he Mark does have lore. Clear. He does have lore because he has to from his background. Mark was very clear that these types of social and intelligence skills would be useful in this AP. But he just thought it would be, this player just thought it would be awesome to not have any of them and laughed about how funny it would be to not have any of them. So, there you go. So, yes, do keep in mind, John... Did not have any social skills. But he had to work hard. He, like, really had to be careful in his selection. I think he has, he has skills. one wisdom skill that he doesn't have, and no yeah. inter charisma other than his lore from his background, and then yeah. he has all the other skills in the game. Yeah, like, he didn't take religion because that was, like, the most knowledge of the... Well, no, he also knew religion could be used in verbal duels for allegory. And uh, he, he yes, wanted to right. have no skills that could be used in verbal duels. That's true. Um, unless athlete lore was one of the lores because that comes he couldn't up. he couldn't quite avoid that um yes that's right because he has his athlete lore from being an athlete so anyway those are the seven characters that sometimes show up and it just depends on who's there this day for instance niv was not there this day mm -hmm. when we did the heist so they're trying to break into this incredibly well-guarded stronghold that has been taken by subterfuge or force by kadira and taldor time and time again constantly defended against every technique that was used to defeat it the last time and I've mentioned all the medical protections. Mm -hmm. So, what was their plan? Well, they started out with a plan. They, they, they were six of them that day. They were going to replace two sets of three guards that went out for daily. Well, because first we scouted out to see what the guards were doing. And then we learned that they always left in, in groups of three. So we decided that we would break ourselves into two groups of three. So, GM Reckless says, if it ain't sports, it's crap. Actually, John is more known for, like, creep stalking around after people with stealth and high perception. And even managed to follow, um, do an exceptionally high series of roles, follow, like, Eutropia and Mertella to their rendezvous during part one. Even, uh, that, no, he only got spotted after a while. But he's just known for doing that. Uh, so, on our, uh, on our wiki that we have for our, our group, we have like little images for each character to sort of thematically represent them. So for my character, it's Frog from Chrono Trigger because her name is Frogry. Mark has pretty much every NPC call her Frog as a nickname, and um, she likes weapons and Not armor. Every NPC for... call actually called her Frog, although um, Carrius. Carrius called her Froggy. That's true. Anyway, uh, but but John John's image is like a stock photo of some guy like peeking through a gap between blinds and i think He's that like, represents hey. his character very well <laughs> yep it's perfect so um they were going to replace two sets of three guards now the way that they did this was as felina as possible because the one who who got the replacement done was carla so carla went on six dates with mm -hmm. six guards including one that was not really technically a date because that guard was in a relationship with um with a guy and was not interested in carla mm -hmm. but he went uh, she went on six dates and um then beat the crap out of the guard at the end of the date and um basically had an excuse to ask lots of personal information so if 
somebody's mother's name came up, then um, Carla knew what it was and could tell the PCs what to say. So they had six guard outfits. That also gave us a chance to prepare, uh, to prepare banter that would make it seem like we were those guards, so we could be like asking each other about stuff with each other's families and things like that. And since Felena is an imperial lord who believes that there is no contradiction between mm -hmm. uh, being feminine and also kicking ass, yes, it was kind of a very Felena thing to do. So yeah, she was she was wearing a pretty dress, and then she kicked the ass of all of the guards. Yes. Or one at a time. One at a time, yes. Yep. And so they they had their identities. Frogry um, sort of manipulated some armor to make sure people were in the kind of armor they wanted to be and still were dressed as the guards. And then they set up, but they realized they had to make two groups. And since the groups left on 30-minute intervals, one group was going to have to make it in and stay there for a half an hour. So we knew that we were going to be separated, which means that we wanted to be sure we had some way to communicate with each other. So we had a telepathic bond up on everyone who was going in in the forward group, as well as one signal person on the outer group, so that we would be able to communicate with each other and we're silently communicate with each other while we were within the area, and also have someone on the outside to ping in case things went wrong. Also, um, due to the fact that none of the six guards mm -hmm. they got was size small, and very few guards are size small, Quingle, the gnome, decided that, um, everyone decided that Quingle was going to be a serious problem. So after some ideas about putting him on stilts or other things like that, they eventually decided that um, they technically had seven characters, so we would pretend Niv was there, perhaps, to be the sixth guard. And Quingle was going to turn into a bat using a cloak of the bat, mm -hmm. hidden like... I think in the person who had the best disguise is clothes and he, he other was, gear. He was, was hidden in a pouch tea. inside my arm. No, it was with no, tea. No, he, and he ended up hiding inside With the garments. second group because it doesn't last long enough That's for the That's right. Group. We were initially going to hide him in a pouch inside and with my arm. And with the party's best non-detection, it's because he's obviously going to be up under a false disguise. Yeah. So everybody got a, a low-grade non-detection so that they could be cantrips like detect magic. Uh, and Kringle got a high-grade non-detection that was, um, like, I think level five or six. Yeah. And the start, so the groups were split out so that there needed to be people to use the, um, sort of the follow the expert tactic from, um, so Night Fox asked, what about Cloak of Resistance? Well, there is no Cloak of Resistance in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, in fact... So we just have you the just runes have, on our armor. Yeah, you just have the, resi have the resilience runes on your armor, and you can wear whatever cloak you want. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just be tied to cloaks of resistance. So we didn't question Night Fox. We yes. never do leading questions. Definitely no. not in any of our interviews. My interview with Louise had 0% of one type of question, either leading <laughs> or not leading. You could decide which one. Oh my gosh. It's like, Luis, why, why, wouldn't it be cool if there was this kind of thing in this book? Wink, wink, nudge. Wink, wink, wink. Yep. So, um, the exploration tactic, follow the expert, was very important. This is a tactic that, basically, this would not have worked due to John's obstinance without this tactic. Mm -hmm. It allows one character who is at least an expert in a skill to lead a bunch of other characters who are not necessarily experts, or maybe they are. Um, it lets them add their level, even if they're untrained, and then gives a circumstance bonus based on how expert the group is. Now, Frogry, as well as T, um, the rogue, were both masters in deception, because Frogry is a lion player. Mm -hmm. So, um, that gives everyone else a plus three. So that means that what they did was they put all their best non-master characters... Um, in the in the group with Frogry that went in first, because Frogry's charisma is not great as a dwarf, but mm -hmm. that way that there would be T, who was what the party's best um, deceiver, who was a, who was a master, would be the one who was shepherding um, shepherding John, who doesn't know what he's doing, and had Quingle the bat hiding amongst her effects, and yes. um, then Niv the maybe he's here, maybe he's not, in case because we didn't know if the player was coming later on was also in that final group. So they split up into these two groups, and the first group sneaks in. Well, um, they make it past all the precautions they know about. They weren't invisible. There's no scrying or teleportation. Their disguise passes muster, and they're doing great. And they're using Fall the Expert, even though everyone in this group is at least trained. And actually, a lot of them are a little better than Frogry because of higher charisma. 
Um, but they use it so Froggy gives those other people plus three so they won't fail. The one that was in question a little bit more was Froggy that she made it to. Yeah. And so they go in, and they and 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 Brian says part one of the plan: split the party. That's well, right. Well, I mean, we kind of had to. So they go in. But we had telepathic bond up, so we knew that the other folks could rush in if they had. And they had thirty minutes to wait for the next group, and they take their places on the wall where they're assigned to go, and just sort of stand there on the wall. Yeah, for we're a having bit. our little conversation with telepathic bond. It's like, okay, I'm looking around, I'm seeing these kinds of things. Where do we want to go next? That kind of. And then trying to trying to plot out how we're going to plan things and relay some information back to the other group, but thinking that we've got our we've got some time to figure this out. There's no dire rush or anything. Surely the GM isn't about to throw a curveball our way. And they made it past detect magic with their baseline non detection, just like baseline non detection pretty much always does, and everything was okay. The problem was in any good heist, there's the time when things go wrong. And this time, it was because of Dame Avena's spell that let her know immediately not only that the PCs had entered, but which way they entered through and who which PCs it was. Now, guards are not the only ones who come in and out. There are also, like, crafts people and other folks who work at the, um, who work at the fortress who would have entered around that time. So the guards were not immediately the only possibility. Also, they could have slipped in maybe somehow invisible and beating the invisibility wards or some or just sneaked in with stealth even though there was nowhere to hide if they were legendary at sneaking or something like that at the same time so they didn't immediately say it's got to be these guards but dana venna came down into the main hall and she started bringing in people who were known to have come in at about that time period to have them checked so one of the guard sergeants came up to these um, to these three guards and requ- demanded that they come with him to go get checked by Dame Avena. And they, the guard sergeant at that point told us, like, oh, we've heard that these three, that, like, what was it, like, we've heard that Frog, Frog Iron, Iron Temper, Temper and, and who else was in that first and group? Carla Carla Vinmark, Vinmark and, and Eustace, Eustace Lothied have, have, sneaked in, have sneaked into the fortress. And they were like, oh, no, not those three. So, um, Night Fox asks, would you be able to beat the invisibility ward with a higher level invisibility? So, um, it depends on the way the invisibility ward worked, and they didn't want to take a risk on that, uh, because it depends, yeah, it depends on if the, how the invisibility ward worked. In this case, they would have been able to actually beat Dame of Venna's weird thing if they had given everyone a high grade non-detection, but they only gave it to, and they might not have been guaranteed, but they only gave it to the bat. Yeah. Um, so. And and we didn't have a reason to think that we needed to have, like, the sorcerer and the wizard invest all their highest level spells into putting the highest level possible non-detections on folks. They they comp- contemplated it, actually, but they're like, you know what, Game of Venna's best spells still have a good enough chance that not every non-detection will beat them, so let's not. Yeah. The only one who even had a ghost of a chance of putting them up, and we'll see Ew, in a moment. Oh, it's so much ahead. Yes, we'll see in a moment when they get panicked and think about doing this was the sorcerer, because... Despite what people say about sorcerers and wizards, in the heat of the moment when you friggin' need this spell right now, at this level right now, mm-hmm. the sorcerer who has signature spell non-detection <laughs> can do that if, if necessary. So, yeah, the three exact PCs that it was um, are like these three, and it's like, we know it's not you, it's probably not you guys, but we have to get you checked out so that you can get back to work and to help us root out the actual people. And so we're like... Oh, yeah, of course. And meanwhile, the telepathic bun, we're, we're like, freaking we're out. Like, crap, crap, crap. It's like, do we need to signal the others? What are we going to do? Do we have a way around this? Are we getting non-detection people? Oh, but I don't have a good way to hide my casting of non-detection. What if we pretend we need to go to the bathroom? They're not going to let us all go to the bathroom at the same time. And so on and so forth. What if we have John start trying to snipe people on the walls to, to distract everyone? It's like, maybe the gig is up. Maybe we just start fighting right now. Or we could abort mission. Uh, we can all get away very easily. There's several places we could go, like the secret passageway, and they're not going to be able to chase we, us down that yeah, way. Yeah, and then we trigger the, the, the you know, the um, telepathic bond of the people outside the wall, and we're like, sneak up, make sure you're close, get ready, we may have to do something. Because they've been on the wall for a while now. Yeah. It, it was getting close to the 30 minutes, and if the other group came in then, it would be a little early. But they started, so T, who was taking charge, and the others were following the expert, just had them sort of gossiping and talking to each other while sauntering slowly in no hurry towards um, their post. It's just very visible um, because it's, the reason she did this was that they started alighting on a plan. And the plan was 
fire, as it usually is for Eustace. <laughs> Fireball is his most go-to spell. That's where he goes at almost any situation, which is why Frogry now demands a resist energy fire. Yep. Um, because fireballing the party. I've been fireballed enough times. So actually, he had one plan where he would fireball the party and, and make it look like they were under attack. But then he was like, but our supposed corpses wouldn't be turned to ash, and I don't know if we could get away. So <laughs> here's the plan he came up with. Using conceal spell to conceal the fact that he was the one creating the spell... He shot a fireball at the stables, where all the horses were, and all the hay and other flammables. While everyone was watching those fireballs, using that distraction, Carla, uh, trying to hide under the sound and hoping no one was watching her for manifestations, because they were all looking where the giant explosion was, at the same time cast a... Um, a, what, what was the was illusion it? spell? It was a pretty high level spell too. It's the high it was, level, oh, illusory, the illusory scene. scene. That's what it Cast was. Cast an illusory scene that was a scene of like their actual characters that had all sneaked in and Eustace cackling madly with his fireball and be like, ah, I've destroyed your stables. Now we will get your sleeping people. And then running into the um, like the barracks. So now this is an illusion, so based on the wards, this is glowing with bright fire. It was fire. clearly glowing with fairy fire. But that could illusion. mean that any other illusion It could have meant that it was invisibility, yes. and that they had just become visible because of the wards, and had been hiding somewhere up until then. It was unclear to the guards. And then this illusion goes running into a building, and then disappears because it's an illusion. So, at this point... The guards are freaking out. The second group, after hearing the explosion, which they've been primed to know was going to happen, so they reacted as like, oh crap, there's an explosion, and just ran forward, even though it was ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. And they started um, closing off the gates, but they rushed in before the gates were closed and were sort of inspected very quickly and ushered in because of this giant fire uh, attack that clearly indicated that the PCs were in there. Meanwhile, Dame Avena noticed that the other PC sneaked in, except Quingle, because his high-grade non-detection actually passed Buster, barely, against the wards, uh, with a pretty good roll. So, it was like, oh, everyone except Quingle is here, um, mm -hmm. is essentially what Dame Avena would know, knew at that point. So, at that point, so, one of the reasons they did this is, at first they were going to be escorted, but Carla kept using a shameless request. To she get the guy, to get the guy escorting them to give up information. It's like, what's gonna happen? It's like, oh, she just does some magic thing. It's, it's like, painless. oh, but I'm so nervous. Like, is this gonna be okay? That it's like, be... it's okay. There's lots of guards there, and they figured out that, like, just in case the PCs showed up, that a bunch of guards and like Baron Roderis, and, or no, it was it wasn't Baron Roderis. It was um, he was still manning the. Uh, it was some half orc guy that I can't remember. The right now. were still there even in the and, end. And um, also, uh, so it was that half orc. And um, the elf, half-elven sorcerer that you guys knew about, and the uh, the divs, the sisters of indulgent dreams, everyone, everyone divs, um, were also there, and nobody knew that that's who they were because you just knew they were some random courtier women. Yeah. Uh, although they had killed Esmeralda at that point, so it was the other two sisters. Mm -hmm. So um, the PCs were like, "That's too much. We can't beat that." Fortunately, the fireball caused a reprioritization. A lot of the garrison that was in there waiting to watch uh, whoever Dame Avena checked started rushing out. And since didn't all, we like also we waited for they were like what's going on and we didn't. They say asked anything. what's we going on and it. then T told them what was going on yeah. pretending to be from the other group. So that it wouldn't be one of us in that group because she may be suspicious of the people who she was who are coming to be investigated right. saying something. Meanwhile, John, by the way, almost didn't pass Buster, but he used a hero point and that followed expert and he made it. Despite not having any charisma based skills, he he made it in. So on his own, he would naturally have had a minus one. He, yeah, and uh, but because of the assistant, they gave him a, a relic of old Taldor for a plus two, so that would have been a plus one on his own. And then he got his level. But oh, yeah, then he two. got his level, so that was another like twelve, so that was plus thirteen, and then, and then three, three from, from the... T, so that was plus yeah. sixteen. Yeah. And he, he needed like twenty eight or something like that. Yeah. So he got it. Okay, so they're in, and then T tells the people inside, oh, yeah, all six of them ran into the barracks. And so at this point, they deprioritize Dame Avena because they make, they know, oh, yeah, the people she checks aren't really going to be the PCs. They're all up there. But they decide to still have her check just in case. 
And so the PCs are sent in, but now the only people who are there are Dame Avena, two basic guards, one of the like super like evil capitalist avatar cult that is there, the measure and the chain, who are like, if you're poor, that's because you're a bad person and you don't know how to do things right. And then um, the two sisters of indulgent dream, the divs, um, were were there as well. Um, as well as Dame Avena. So Dame Avena was going to um check on the group using her divinations that the same ones that detect whether those exact particular people are there um and at that point eustace approached and showed her the um the note that they had from the lion blades that deputized them to arrest maxilla by there because he knew that that dame Avena tried to be a political and mostly just cared about her research so they started using diplomacy, and a little bit of deception, mostly diplomacy, to try to convince Dame Avena to stand down. Meanwhile, the Sisters of Indulgent Dreams were saying, no, uh, kill them now to the guards and the uh, and the cleric, or run and go get people. And so at this point, we realized time was of the essence. Dame Avena said, I'm listening to what they're saying. If you want to fight now without me, go ahead. But if you, if you wait... I will fight alongside you, Sisters of Indulgent Dreams, if they turn out to be full of shit, basically. <laughs> so, um, yes, time was of the essence, but all, none of the guards or, uh, or that chaplain had left Yeah. at that point. So they were managed to convince Dame Avena, and she decides she's going to stand down. Well, we, uh, we used an item to allow us to impart information to her much more quickly than we would have otherwise. Yes, it was a staff of lesser mind, mentalist staff to use Mindlink to send her 10 minutes of information all at once. Because we knew that she wasn't going to trust us to just cast any old spell on her, but that that staff at least had... That staff had no spells in it that were actually a threat to her, and mm -hmm. she knew that it didn't, so she allowed the Mindlink. Uh... And the, that imparted 10 minutes of information, which was enough for the PCs to convince her. We basically did a campaign ad against Pytherius. It's like, Pytherius works with Kadirin. It was like, Py Pytherius creates false flag Kadirin attacks to undermine, tell, to undermine the Talvin military and spread fear throughout the land, stoking war for his own ambitions. Like, 10 minutes of that. Yep. So, um, at that point... Pytherius allies with Divs. And here's the things that Pytherius covered up and helped his father cover up a murder. Just, like, onward and onward. All the things that we knew that Pytherius had been involved in or his underlings had been involved in. He's the family values guy. But He's he, the family values he helped guy. His, like, I guess he was with, working with his family when he mm -hmm. helped his father cover up a murder. Yeah. A family that covers up murders together stays together. Yeah, no, really. We rolled, I think we rolled deception for that, but yeah. Um, so that eventually convinced Dame Avena, and she stood down. So at that point, the PCs got into a brief fight with um, the two uh, divs, the Sisters of Indulgent dreams as well as um two rando guards and a cleric and they managed to take out the guards and the cleric using like chain lightning and other um and other abilities quickly before they could get away um one of the sisters of indulgent dreams they absolutely annihilated because john had rebuilt into disruptive stance and a short sword mm -hmm. and started running up after her and just and readying actions to run up after her more and had um, combat reflexes or whichever the one to get another reaction to take attack opportunity again. It was just disrupting we all of the spells. We run into enough challenge and casters at this point that he wanted to retrain for that. That was Illumia was killed and Megilla got away. Mm -hmm. She escaped into the ethereal plane. So at that point, uh, the alarm was still going on and Dame Avena went back up to her tower and um, the PCs asked if, like, if she would give them a, additional assistance. Was like, no, but you can escort me up to my tower since you're guards. Carla made another shameless request. Yeah, Carla they? used a shameless request to try to get her to um, to help them. So the PCs went up to her tower, and um, Jam Reckless says, "Not Bill. Who's Bill? I don't get it. I'm not sure. Um, so." They went up to the top of her tower, where they then disintegrated the southern wall of her tower, which was connected to the top floor of Pytherius' main keep. 
uh, which actually led them into the middle of his treasure vault on the side where you didn't have to get through the vault door. Mm -hmm. So they grabbed, there was glittering um, gold and other uh, valuable metals, but they grabbed the papers that were back there, as many as they could. Because we wanted information to help us in our case. Oh, oh, Bill the Rando Bill Guard. The oh, Rando. Oh, yeah. I got it. Like yeah, Bob. Yeah. Bob, like Bob the, guard. the Rando Guard, yeah. They actually somehow didn't kill the guards because of the fact that the the guards got to like two hit points and they knocked him out with non lethal yeah. damage. Although that, that, that cleric who critically failed the first save and nearly instantly died was very close. He was, it was very lucky that only the higher level, 10th level cleric failed the save rather than the even lower level guards. Yeah. So there's totally a brass golem in the room with the treasure, but the PCs, using haste, um, one of them was able to like unlock the vault from the inside and then just leave the room, which the golem wouldn't leave um, at first. And then the rest of the PCs started stealing the papers, which the golem was going to chase them. But they found that Pytherius' room was right there, but he had left his war room because he saw the stables burning and his beloved horse Honor was in the stable. So... He had jumped out of the window, taking falling damage, mm -hmm. and then ran into the burning stables to um, to get his horse back. So the PCs all like grabbed papers, ran away, and then jumped out the window as well. Using Where he, fe he was, he had gotten his horse. He was now on horseback, like trying to rally people yes. to deal with the using injuries. feather fall and fly spells that kind of got buffeted by wind to fall into the courtyard with Pytherius. At which point. They tr attempted to place him under arrest. Now, I forgot to mention this, but T changed her disguise to be Illumia after they got Illu after they got Illumia's talisman that let Illumia um, use scrying and teleportation magic. Um, and she had um, a, a skill feat that let her trick magic into thinking that her disguise was legit. So that the magic talisman would think she was actually Illumia. So she was disguised as Illumia for this. This, is, this becomes important later. So... They then get into a giant verbal duel with Pytherius where they try to convince him to submit to uh, submit to the authority of the Lion Blades and to um, go under arrest awaiting trial for his misdeeds. And it was a long and really interesting verbal duel with a lot of... The, the PCs started off on the upper hand really hammering into Pytherius with some evidence they had found, like the dagger front murder weapon of, that his father had used. Uh, but then Pytherius was catching back up because the PCs started taking penalties for their many successes, and he got a few good licks in on the PCs and had brought them... The, Pytherius started at, like, 29, mm -hmm. but he took a ton of damage from that dagger. The PCs started at 21. At one point, the PCs were down to 8, but Pytherius had been down to, like, 5 or 6 for a while. And then the PCs started defeating him with flattery. Now, I don't know how much you know about verbal duels, but uh, we use the regular verbal duel system from PF1, just ported to PF2. Flattery deals two less damage, but gives you an extra edge that lets you re-roll. Uh, Pytherius was vulnerable to flattery. Uh, so T, who was disguised as a Lumia, would make flattery comments. <laughs> so and it would be things like, uh, it was like, well, we haven't talked about the Rakshasas yet. Let's get the Rakshasas out there. So she would be like, because Pytherius would say a thing, and she'd be like, boss, you're the greatest, and we all know that we want you to win. But these guys have too much. We have to give up. They even know about the, the evil plans with the Rakshasas. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so like, it, was, it, was like, it was like the mother of all, Olivia wants, please stop helping. Yeah, stop helping. It's like we need to, the best bet is to just give in and, 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 and we can bring the trial or things <laughs> like that. And so um, it was like flattery. And not only did they make good progress with the flattery, but the finishing blow to Pytherius, his determination was dealt by a flattery request of, like, someone as great as you, great uh, Lord Pytherius, has respect for the rule of law and the laws of Taldor, and you wouldn't want to be, uh, you wouldn't want to be remembered for, like, you know, fl flouting those, but instead for your triumph that you'll surely have in court against these charges or something like that, and so he eventually was defeated by flattery. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of that giant heist. So what are some takeaways from this? First of all, heists are alive and well, and thanks to the Fall the Expert tactic and some of the spell heightening shenanigans, there's really a lot of options, and of course the classic heist moment where things go wrong and you have to 
change the plan to a different plan. To, to call it the fall of the expert tactic a little more, the, the, our uses of deception and stealth are things that really don't normally work when, as well whenever you have a large group of people and some of them are just really low. Someone, you know, you're clanky armor person to or things fair, like that. To be fair, everyone in the group has stealth. Yes. However, fall the expert combined with T's skill fate, which was um, quiet allies, that allows the weakest person to roll and nobody else has to roll in the group, really helps because when you have a group of seven, somebody's going to roll badly. But if only the lowest person has to roll with the bonuses from Fall of the Expert, which T is a master in that as well, so that's three more, then like your bonus plus three is still pretty good, even yeah. though you're in full play. But just the fact that you know that there isn't going to be anyone who's so low but in their bonus that they're going to like tip you over the edge to not being able to... To get past it. Rocket Lotus has a question. Did all yeah. PCs participate in the verbal duel? Did Max Lair get more turns than each PC? The way it works in a... in a um, So it was a multi-way verbal duel where it was one of the three groups being the troops that are easier to beat and get them to turn on Pytherius. We didn't but even try on the them. The troops also don't participate other than to be targets and the PCs wanted to duel Pytherius. They wanted the harder duel. Mm -hmm. It is also a group duel. The way a group duel works is Pytherius goes, then any of the PCs, then Pytherius, then any of the PCs. When you're doing a group duel, the entire character takes a minus two penalty for winning in exchange, rather than just one tactic. So when Pytherius would win with presence, his presence took a minus two. But when Frogry would win at all, Frogry took a minus two. And so did everyone participate? John, to um, what he wanted was to not participate. And he yes. specifically took every skill not to participate, and he didn't. But Linda's fighter participated and got two very good licks in on Pytherius. Um, and I think I, what did I use? Like I used like deception for one of them. I think and so, and I don't remember I what, what you did with oh, the other one. Oh, espionage lore. Espionage lore. That's, That's right. What I used for the other she used one. espionage lore for the other one. Absolutely, because you got that from Lion Blade. Yeah, because I was. I think I'm like a expert or master of espionage. Maybe an lore. expert in I think espionage lore. I'm an expert lore. of espionage lore. Yeah. Um. So you got in two good licks from that. Um. But T with her flattery mm -hmm. was actually the party's best, not because she had the highest bonus, but because the bonuses for Pytherius liking flattery and the fact that his best was presence, which is weak against flattery, meant that T was, was operating under like a plus four extra that she got for using flattery. And that put her flattery at the party's highest, which was important when they needed to make a really high stakes roll for a lot of determination. And then um, Quingle was their opener a lot of the time with some kind of allegory because he had both religious allegory and he also really knew Talden history. So they would like have dueling parables about different Talden emperors that had to deal with certain situations in their time. Like, well, this emperor learned was was loyal to his brother for a long time until he realized his brother was a traitor to Taldor who was just handing everything over to the Kadir and that he was forced to assassinate his brother and become one of the greatest emperors of Taldor. They would just tell stories about Taldor emperors in the past. And, uh, yeah, and yes, Rocket Lettuce, we did decide as a group who would take a turn. We wanted to, we wanted to sort of balance it out to make sure that all of us got a chance to shine, and the mechanics also supported that as well, because, um, with a tighter math in 2nd edition, it's not as much the case, it was the oh, case where... 1st edition it, has special rules to make sure that it works, too. Yeah. You don't get the crazy bonuses in Pathfinder First Edition. That's right. That's right. They turn into right. edges. So, so as we, so you're you're right. I'm sorry, but as we as we went along, like it, it, we get to the point where the person who was best at a particular thing to start with was no longer the best at that one. So even if we had been looking at it from a strictly who has the highest number perspective and not in terms of like, okay, what are our general good things we can do? Oh, would you like to do this one and things like that? So, so we just fell into a rhythm with that. That's right. So in the end, like. Niv wasn't there, John didn't participate, but the other five characters, I think, each wound up smacking Maxilar two, two, three times, I think. Yeah. Uh, and that is how they that is how they beat Pytherius. It was sort of close, except for that they really had him on the ropes to the point that he was forced to like not concede one or two point um, determination losses, even mm -hmm. on a very high roll, because even that was a big problem for him. Yeah. And the group versus single dynamic, where the whole person loses it in the group, versus Pythagoras just losing on one tactic, 
that helped a lot. Plus, yeah, they go back and forth. Pytherius, any PC. Pytherius, any PC. So, otherwise, it just completely used the verbal dual rules. It was suitably epic, and Pytherius gave up, and the PCs moved on into part five. So, we had a lot of fun with the role play there, too, for sure. Yes, of just the different things that they said to him, and um, it was it was definitely a good session, and a lot of people commented on enjoying the heist. So, I mean, they didn't necessarily call it a heist at the time, but it was definitely a heist. It was. Um, especially it's... as defining ultimate intrigue of, like, layers of defenses and parties sometimes split. Parties like, splitting yeah. up, weird having to figure out how to get out of a scrape of the of the twist that happens in the end. So, um, does anyone have any questions here um, about the heist or PF2 in general? Another thing that helped with PF2 was just sort of, like, the levels of spells that go act and counteract against each other yeah. really made it interesting in terms of like Quingle's bat ability that Dame Avena was surprised that Quingle was there because um, she had seen oh they're all here except Quingle they're all here except Quingle, Quingle's clearly not here yep if he were I would have noticed with my magic and the PCs skipped like 20 encounters or some crazy amount of encounters it was close to 30 wasn't it maybe if you count all of the different um or I think it was 30 to 40 active combatants. Oh, that's what it was. That's what it was, yeah. That, um, we skipped a lot of combat. That were 8th level or higher. Our goal was to um, our goal was to get Pytherius to surrender while killing as few people as possible, which is why we which is why we targeted the stables because we decided that was the building that was probably least likely to have people in it and hopefully and sorry horses but we really didn't want to kill people, and you, we, figured that they killed, would, we figured that they would be able to you save killed most of them. You Illumia, an unknown number of stable hands and horses, and that was it. Yeah. So, that's... We didn't, want to, we didn't want to hit, like, the barracks where people were sleeping or anything else like that. Sorry, horses, you use minion rules, says Rico the Bulb. Yeah. But you can't hit the gardens, because otherwise you'll go and get the leshies. No, don't get the leshies. Well, Frogger, Frogger doesn't have any particular opinion toward leshies, so. No, she doesn't? No. Okay. I, I don't just arbitrarily have a thing where all of my characters like leshies. Okay. Remember, I had, I had a character who was totally cool with and liked spiders, and I have arachnophobia in real life. That was because of a weird random role where the spiders were helpful. Yeah, and then she likes spiders from there on out. Oh, it's not arbitrary to like leshies, says Rico and <laughs> That's true, but she doesn't have, like, a backstory reason or things like that to have that kind of connection. So, um, Brian wants to know if they you guys explored the castle after arresting Maxilar? No. Uh, not, not particularly. We went back, well, we went back in to make sure that we had cleaned out all the documents. Uh, and, uh, let's clean out all the documents from the area, and, um, other than that, um, we generally wanted to, we're more focused on the fact that we had Pytherius in captivity and we needed to make sure to bring him back safely and not have him, like, bolt and escape us or something like that. So that was a, uh, that was a, a larger priority. Also, we were pretty darn concerned with some of the information that we had found out from Pytherius at that stage, such as the fact that, uh, the Eutropia, it said that the Stavian family was descended from, um, a reviled family in Telden history, and also that he had a um, a, men a severely mentally unstable and previously thought to be dead uh, former Grand Prince um, Stavian the Third in his uh, in in his prison attic there. So we were kind of like we could explore this place, but we really need to like get back and deal with the fact that we're about to have a political bombshell. That we have the that we have like the the most popular general in Taldor as our political prisoner, and that we also have to somehow disguise the fact that we have the former king of Taldor with a uh, with us. Oh, hold while on, also... hold on. He would have gladly prepared phantom steeds for you. You wouldn't have had to have used his cast it. You just no, had to let him look at your spell book. No, we are not giving a spell book to him. Holy crap! We've seen what he did the last time. He got a chance to decide if he was going to do any massacred half of he the Taldor. He didn't even use any of his spells for that. Yeah, I know. We're not gonna give him back his spell book. But anyway, yeah, we were. But anyway, yeah, we were too uh, distracted by uh, by all uh, by all of that. Oh, he was fishing to see if you guys found. Yeah, Stavian. no, we we did we did find Stavian. 
Um, and we did, we did do that. We didn't, but what we didn't do in terms of exploring the castle, we didn't go through and looted for the treasure. We figured that this money and this treasury was to be used for the defense of Taldor against the Kadiran threat. And the last thing we wanted to do was, um, reduce the, uh, reduce the nation's defenses, um, particularly when doing so would also, like, be bad for our PR. It, so. made it would make it look like the loyalists are just raiding the defense against Kadira for Exactly, so we just took the documents for the purpose of, of uh, court trial and things like so that. So because they didn't screw up the national security, I had the Lion Blades, when they seized some of Pytheris' assets, uh, give a tip of the, uh, the head and give some of that to Martella, and she gave some of that to the PCs, and they got a 15,000 GP bonus for not, like, stripping down and looting one of the main defense areas against Kadira. And 15,000 GP is a lot in, in second edition. Yeah. Because, you know, if you strip down a fort, then you're going to get the good old Kadiran hug. Yep. Ah! Uh. Because Kadirans believe that you um, always embrace someone when you're meeting them, whether they're friend or foe. Because for your friend, you just show them how close you are, and for your foes, they need a knife in their back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, we, we have, we have Stavian, oh, uh, funny story, when we had, when we were on our way back, we were going back through Stakus, um, the town that, um, that, it's the town you renovated it's in the part town two. you renovated in part two, and, uh, Mark had, uh, the people of Stakus think that the Stavian, the real Stavian we had with us was a Stavian, was a Stavian lookalike jester, who, and then he's, so like, at first, most people didn't recognize him without his crown and his, um, and his book, but the peasants started talking to Eustace, He's like, who are these filthy peasants? Get them away from me. I am Grand Prince Stavian III. So then they thought he was a Stavian impersonator. And then they, like, flipped a copper piece over to him, and he was super insulted. So we decided to play along with the idea that he was a Stavian impersonator and, like, collect the copper pieces out of the dirt and, like, give a thumbs up to people as if he were, like, totally a Stavian impersonator all along. Yep. And then he saw Carius and blanched. And was like, no, what is going on? No. And then ghost. Uh, it's ghosts. And then Eutropia sent him to a place to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, Should, do I get spell books too? Because they gave Bartleby magical research. Eustace made sure that Bartleby got um, a nicer prison because he sort of felt guilty that he absolutely betrayed Bartleby after Bartleby saved his life. Um, all right, so GM Reckless asks, how much is that kind of wealth convert to magic items in PF2? Would it only be usable for common magic items and uncommon ones unleashed in the campaign? In other words, how prevalent are magic shop assumptions? We use it to buy, uh, we use it to buy common items in that case. Well, we all had common items in this common case, items. Frogry herself, like, had the formula for fundamental runes. Yeah. So, much of that money, but not all, was used upgrading fundamental runes on weapons and armor that were not relics of old Taldor. Plus upgrading Frogry's um, shield into a ridiculous shield. Because while Pytherius had a ridiculous shield, she gave it to John, who had yet again rebuilt his character mm -hmm. into a shield build. Um, Cause that, because the thing is that my <laughs> character is so proud of her armor, she wanted to be sure that she was wearing some of her armor at all times. Oh, because she took the relic full plate. So I took the, the relic full plate. At the parts of the party, I had to convince me to She take almost the relic didn't, plate. even though yes. she was the only full plate user, and it was really good because. Her armor was like her main pride. But I, but I was I was only be able to be, she was only able to be convinced to do that under the thing that she would then uh, craft an upgrade for the shield that she's been crafting and then make it match the style of the armor. Because if the party had let her, she could have looted Pytherius's armor and shield and then just had some ridiculous stuff. Plus, then I wasn't like taking every all the. So Night Fox is wondering if there's a formula or guide for converting Pathfinder First Edition adventures and the rewards to Pathfinder Second Edition. So um, adventures are pretty easy to convert. Mostly subsystems convert pretty cleanly so far. All the ones I've had to run, I just convert no conversion. Monsters convert easily. NPCs I can, I can build on the fly. That doesn't mean everyone can, but mm -hmm. I did make the second edition of the game, so it's easier to um, to convert it. Um, items are can be a little bit more challenging. Mostly what I just do is take a look. I mean, the relics of Old Tower are so ridiculous that that helps keep the party well, but they are a big group. Um, they're big, certainly bigger than the number of relics, so mostly what I do is take a look at the expectations of, of treasure drops that are in the game mastering section for the PF2 core rulebook 
and I take a look at what items are of about those levels that are like sort of fundamental items the PCs don't have. Mm -hmm. And then I, I stick those in in various places um, in addition to just direct conversions of items that I feel like converting and then I subtract items that I don't feel like converting. So Adventure Paths by Standard have well over uh, well over the sort of wealth by level curve. Assuming so, you find everything. Assuming that you find everything because you're not necessarily going to find everything. So would you say that you're basically, we basically have all these powerful relics plus approximately wealth by level even without accounting for those? Or do you do you account for those at least somewhat? Because they're like really, really good. I would good. say you you might not have full wealth by level for six people not accounting for that because I didn't also do a six player wealth conversion. Okay, but we're still we're still very well off. So we have a lot of us. You items. have full wealth for four characters and all the relics, and you're sa six to seven characters. Yeah. Um, because that seemed like it worked. If I, if it didn't, I would have also done a seven player, six to seven player wealth adjustment on top. Because um, Night Fox, if you've done any APs with a large number of players, you probably know that you have to do your own conversion even in PF one um, to have the right amount of stuff for um, for all those players. All right, so um, Brian's asking about the Persona system and how it worked out. That system seems pretty brilliant designed, and then an innocent looking Leshy emoji. And I've, you, you've mentioned that I've made it before, yes, haven't you? Yes, That's probably That's the only that. reason why, that that innocent Leshy is in there. Why, why thank you. I, I do appreciate that. The Persona system has been working pretty well. Um, what I did was, it ranked 5 when you normally get a feat off of a random list of like some not that great PF1 feats. Instead, what it does is it gives you a skill feat based on the skills that are associated with that facet of Persona. I decreased the plus 2 and plus 4 retcon um, circumstance bonus to 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. From ranks, I think I want to say four and eight. Yeah, because uh, those bonuses because those bonuses would be too high for the amount of second edition. Also, Linda, your name is on the book and it, uh, in the section about this like persona by Linda Dice Oh, Power. okay, cool. Um, Fair enough. I didn't realize go. that it was credited specifically in that section. Yep. Nice. So there you have it. Um, then for the section about um, claiming, oh yeah, since I'm so good at. Um, Scholarliness, this wizard who would normally be indifferent is friendly to me. I just kept that. And the one where I'm so good at, at being a criminal that this criminal who would be unfriendly is new, is, is indifferent to me. I kept that. Mm -hmm. um, the one about getting free spellcasting services, I converted to a rough... I figured out what the highest level spell you could get with that in PF1 was. And then gave an amount of money that allowed you to get the same exact level of spell in PF2. Um... The operations I can mostly run as is because operations checks don't necessarily work using the regular skill system anyway. Yeah, they And work, then the yeah. rank 10 ability to get an extra phase, not only did I use it normally, but I accidentally screwed up. And when they got their first character got two rank 10 facets, accidentally gave them three phases at the beginning yeah, of I part thought, five. Yeah, I thought you were just being more generous. No, I wasn't gonna that, say was, that was a mistake. And I will rectify that mistake um, because I was like, how is this even going to be close if they get... Three phases, and I was like, oh, because they don't get three phases. Whoops. So the Persona system has actually been working really well. I, d I can't tell you how it works in Pathfinder First Edition because I've never used it in Pathfinder First System, that fast Pathfinder First Edition. But um, in Second Edition, the Persona system works great with using skill feats, all the other benefits except slashing the um, bonus a little bit, and just keeping it keeping it more or less the same. Oh, I created a different scaling for the Persona system and um, what its um, what its DCs are for ranking up. It's basically DC 11 plus 3 for 3 times the, the, the tier that you would be ranking up to, that you're trying to rank up to. So somewhere between 14 and 41. That way it was very hard to get to the maximum rank at of rank 10 at level 10, which Linda initially created to try to be hard for non-super cheese weasels to get yes. good at level 10 in PF1, and that mostly kept it. Although Eustace tried to convince everyone that a random walk where you were likely to critically fail but might get to 10 was worth it because it could you could start getting free bonus um, mm -hmm. situations, and they used a lot of hero points on the Persona system and got a few very early rank 10s anyway. So, so, Linda, what were, were you scrolling up Oh, I was up scrolling for? up to uh, Misty Bloss's comment early. I, earlier. I avoided being uh, squirreled on that, but the thing, no death at all, I may need to change the premise for my 2 homebrew. Okay. So, uh, I guess, I figured it may be worth talking a little bit about, about that point in terms of, like, 
lethality in the game. And if you're so, if you're looking for, a, if they're looking for like a more lethal game or something like that, I mean, it may you could certainly make adjustments to the death and dying. Oh, it's rules, very, if that's what you're, it's, if that's it's what you're very easy wants. to be more lethal. It's just that because of the way that PF1 worked. I had, like, in my Rise of the Rune Lords game, like, 20 deaths or something like that. And it's not because I was... Uh, I never TPK'd them. It was just because any time you have an interesting fight in PF1 that is even remotely close and not a blow-up for the PCs, if damage was involved, someone probably died because it's like, oh, all right, well, what happened? The PC does 395 damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to do 250 damage to you, PC. And if that drops you... Then whether or not your 18 con, which is a pretty good con, is enough of a buffer after taking 250 damage to stay alive, uh, I think so. I had somewhat people challenge them to work out the math on um, a very particular situation where you get plinked for a certain amount of damage and discover that sometimes as the damage goes down, your chance to die can go up because you're likely to go low on hit points yes, and then, and be, then, get killed and then be killed. Just like your chance of dying when knocked unconscious at high levels in PF1 is roughly like 90%. In Rune Lords, my deaths, my kills would have been higher if it weren't for the player of Eustace, who was playing a, um, a character, Professor Ornelos, um, who was the black sheep of the Ornelos family because he was a mystic thirds generalist and cleric of Nethys. And um, he had spell perfection breath of life. So he had the Ornelos special, which was either quicken breath of life, empowered breath of life, or <laughs> quicken breath of life on one character, reach breath of life on a different <laughs> character. And the Ornolo special, um, with two breaths of life on someone, would stop deaths. But you needed that. Um, but if they do, if someone were to want to have, like, a more lethal variant in, in PF2, what would you recommend? Would oh, and Night Fox also said depends on the amount of breath of life, possibly mythic, yes. Yeah. Would you, would you, what would you recommend? Would you recommend, like, raising the, like, reducing the number of dyings that you can take before you're actually dead? I mean, or? if you die at dying three... That still is not going to allow someone to instantly die, except for at low levels when you might take a crit for twice your maximum hit points. Mm -hmm. In fact, at PaizoCon, I, uh, I ran for a Fumbus, and he literally survived by his heritage giving him one fire resistance. <laughs> because he took so much fire that it was twice his hit points exactly, which is enough to kill you if you take twice your maximum hit points in one hit. And then it was reduced by one from his one fire resistance, so he did not die. But other than that, your chance of actually dying, even with dying three, you're not going to die right off. If people are very, very quick to respond and heal you, then you might die when you go back down again. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, if you really want people to die a lot in your game, because even a crit won't kill you with dying three B. Yeah. I guess what you can do is... Um, Say that when you're dying, when, when someone knocks you down, you got dying 1d4. If it's a crit, 1d4 plus 1. Ooh. Uh, that would be nasty. I mean, if you really want people to die about as much as PF1, that actually is still a lower chance of dying usually than PF1. Yeah, no, that, that's true. But, uh, but, uh, but I, I would not do that. Yeah, no, I don't, neither, neither would I. But if you despite want to... what you might think from the fact that I killed 20 characters, not some of them are the same character, but... <laughs> I actually don't want to run games that are super lethal, and I want a dying system that won't kill characters that much in a mm -hmm. close fight. We just didn't, um, we didn't house rule that part of dying away when we were playing PF1. Yeah. We perhaps should have. So I guess the answer to that question is you can, you can mess with the dying rules. And Brian says and that was the elephant strategy. clown fumbus that nearly died. That absolutely was, when Cosmo was playing an elephant clown god that was the avatar of Cosmo or something like that. Cosmo, uh, Cosmo from Paizo is always making clown themed stuff. Every Paizo con. Yep. So, Rico the Bold wonders if anyone uses the death and dying rules on NPCs and monsters. Using a digital tabletop and automating it because it's kind of funny watching them die because they fail flat checks. I generally do most of the time, but the rules say that you don't have to unless they're an important NPC or there's healing in the fight on their side. Uh... Night Fox is wondering if the person who died multiple times was the bard. Let me see. Who died multiple times and actually was brought back to life by that, that Rune Lords party that rarely brought people back to life? It would have had to be late. Was there anyone? Maybe it was just the player who's got, like, 
think one of our players, the players lost who brought new characters uh, until we got the Breath of Life spam, and then we were all dying. Yeah, at lower back. levels, um, you know, you, I'm not counting Breath of Life, but at lower levels, yeah. so Noah was playing Sarah, and then Carnation, Carnation. and then and Carnation then, died. died. So then, is that when he brought in the summoner after the Carnation died? Um, no, no. He, no, he had the, uh, he had like, what was it, Seth? He had Seth the cleric who was killed by Scythe Critical. Yeah, Seth who died to the Scythe. Yeah. And then Basha the Shawanki. And then Basha the Shawanki. Who was killed who during the, the Fort Rennick thing. He was the right. only character who died when it seemed like it was going to be a TBK in Fort Rennick. And then was and it then the after summoner? Basha the Shawanki was the summoner who you guys okay. left behind because you didn't have enough people in a dimension door with like three Lamias. And they wisdom drained him and, and convinced him that he wanted to work for the bad guys. Um, well, we couldn't easily reach it. It was like reaching so him or two he, other And there may have been one more that we missed. So he lost at least five characters. Yeah. I mean, he did He did tend, tend to have a tendency to build, like, really powerful characters and then rush them into the front lines, and then so enemies would attack them because they were doing huge amounts of damage. Because I mean, I mean both of Seth us, was not like that. He was a backline cleric, but the problem was that... He was a cleric of Pharasma. He was a cleric of Pharasma. And, 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 and Lamias hate Pharasma. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was Because Pharasma cursed Pharasma. them. Somebody hated Pharasma. Pharasma cursed one. them with their Lamia form. Uh, Your Jam Rathos' Ruin Lord's group has had one and a half TPKs in book one. Yeah, Ruin Lord's can be really deadly AP. Solid. We were lucky we had as few deaths as we did in book one. Oh, gosh, yeah. She's a... She's a... Zanesha, that's a... Quite the villain. She survived Rune Lords by running away in book six when she was still alive, and she saw the PCs and just ran. Yep. Well, I mean, how scary would it be to have an adversary, and every time they come back, they've just, like, arbitrarily gotten stronger, even though it's just been a short period of time for no reason, for no adequately... It's like a horror movie sequel, where it's like, they're just back, and they're stronger for no reason. I mean, yeah, that would be... That would be an interesting campaign where you're like the monsters and you're fighting against like the quote monsters and you're fighting against these bizarre PCs that just like keep getting arbitrarily stronger and every time you think you've got them figured out like you have to use more and more clever tactics to dodge death at their hands. But then suddenly they not only get stronger but a for some reason every time you kill one of them an equally powerful adventurer just happens to join their group. Yes. I mean, that's what you said. Linda, you said Karzuk deserved to win the adventure Karzuk path. Karzuk definitely deserved to win. If it, if it wasn't win. for the fact that every time he killed some but not all of them, a large number of equally leveled PCs would come. I felt like Karzuk may have been evil, but, like, we were real assholes. Like, we totally <laughs> cheated him by bending the universe to create more high-level PCs who inexplicably decided to join this group against him. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, did anyone else have any more questions about uh, second edition heists? Anything, really? Um, looks like we did pretty well about second edition heists. So um, let's say bye to YouTube and then, and then remind people about Twitch-related stuff again yes. at the end. So bye, YouTube. Bye. See you on the next episode with Owen.